Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual incubator accelerator in the world, headquartered in Silicon Valley with the goal of helping a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars in revenue and beyond, build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. We are here entirely because of you. Our success is entirely predicated upon your success. We will get nowhere if you do not succeed. So this is our 240th 1M1M one &one roundtable. And uh, as you can imagine, we've been doing this for a long time. So 240 of these public roundtables, and we have almost an equivalent number of private sessions. So we've been doing this for a while and um, have gotten a little bit, you know, the hang of it. You'll have the recording available after the session on our YouTube channel as well as on our blog. Our Twitter handle is at 1M by 1M and at Stromana. If you're live tweeting the show, please use hashtag 1M1M. The YouTube channel is 1M1M Roundtables. You'll find recordings of all roundtables. And I will put this slide up later when we are ready for call-ins, but we do have a call-in number uh, using which you can call into the session. Today, um, our event is in celebration of the new Bootstrapping with a Paycheck Entrepreneur Journey series book that just launched um, a couple of weeks ago, and we're continuing with launch events. The theme of the book, as is evident from the title, is that you can actually get something off the ground while holding on to your full-time job. And you know, huge numbers of people around the world have aspirations of becoming entrepreneurs. And this actually, the fact that this is possible actually gives them hope and gives them mechanics of how to start tinkering with an idea or a concept on which you want to build a business. And what we have done, as in all of the Entrepreneur Journey series books, is Use case studies. We have, you know, a dozen case studies of entrepreneurs who have built substantial businesses using bootstrapping, using a paycheck as the primary mechanism. So, um, you know, I have a favorite saying that man can do what man has done. Well, other people have done it. Is it hard? Yes, it's very hard. Entrepreneurship itself is hard and doing something while you have obligations of a full-time job is harder. But it can be done and it has advantages. That's what we highlight in this book. And as part of the launch event, we've invited a very dear friend of mine, Shomit Kosh. We've been friends for a god-awful number of years, Shomit. Is it, what, 20 years or something? 20 years, I think, yeah. <laughs> Shomit is a partner at Onset Ventures and a very successful, accomplished um, entrepreneurial executive in the Silicon Valley startup scene. Uh, you know, there are very few people who have gone through the number of successes that Shomit has gone through, including several IPOs, um, Broad Vision, Tumbleweed. These were, you know, big success stories of the first wave of the internet. And uh, today Shomit is at Onset Ventures and uh, he works with a lot of entrepreneurs on a very, at a very hands-on level. And, and that's really a skill set that you don't find as easily amongst people who are on the venture side of the equation. So welcome, Shomit. It's a great pleasure to have you. You're one of the most thoughtful people in the industry, and it's always great to brainstorm with you. So today we brainstorm publicly. Something we do often privately, we're going to do that publicly today. Thank you very much for such a kind introduction. I am unworthy. <laughs> And very modest, as always. So let's start with um, with this topic of bootstrapping using a paycheck. You know, when I, you like you, I kind of grew up in this Silicon Valley Kool-Aid drinking environment, right? Arrived here very young and, and jumped right into the venture business and as an entrepreneur, and, and everybody had all these maxims that oh, you have to quit your job and otherwise you're not a serious entrepreneur and all, this, all of these, you know, uh, 
saying. Okay. And um, you need truth. Yeah. So now, of course, it's a lot of years have passed since I've hopefully I've gathered a bit of wisdom and and uh, this particular truism, so to speak, or myth that uh, you cannot start a company while you have or start a significant company while you have a full time job. I have come to the conclusion is a myth. Tell me what your thoughts are. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, yeah, I always felt that that was the case. Um, Viscerally, that seemed to be the case, but I had never seen any um, actual validation of it. And then as, as you and I talked about earlier, there was a HBR piece, I don't know, four months ago yeah. that uh, you know, statistically proved that uh, you're better off actually starting a company while you're still employed um, rather than just jumping in all in. And no doubt that's because um, when you do go all in, uh, you put yourself under a lot of stress. It's like... Um, they're having to make decisions um, um, without being able to deliberate on them. And so maybe the quality of the decision-making suffers. And I, I think that as long as you're not um, not compromising your your uh, confidentiality and, and intellectual property uh, agreements with your existing employer, there should be no trouble actually starting your next company while you're still employed with your past company. And uh, as I've covered in the book, actually, at least in our industry, in the technology industry, the trend clearly is that employers want to support, want to have, want to employ, and want to support entrepreneurial employees. So if you are actually tinkering with something, with an idea, with an innovation, and you want your employer to support you, the chances of the employer actually supporting you in that endeavor is quite high. Don't you agree? I agree completely because the employer knows that they're better off having you innovate within the company and keep those ideas within the company ideally, uh, right. and so they would be supportive of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think so, because one of the things that large and more established companies probably lack today is that spirit of innovation. So I think employers, the savvy ones, uh, know to foster that kind of environment. I don't know if I uh, – uh, I don't know if you talked about this. We are doing a lot of projects, actually, uh, in the corporate incubation area with corporate partners to foster intrapreneurship development right now. So, That's right. Yeah, yeah. and uh, even here in Silicon Valley, if you think about it, you know, we're the, uh, the font of creativity and all these great huge startups that are doing wonderful things. But if you look at it, even you know, even Facebook is acquiring WhatsApp and Oculus VR and Google is acquiring YouTube, et cetera. So even these hot, innovative startups who become successful are still acquiring from without. Um, because it's, it's often not sufficient to try and grow from within. There's so much creativity outside your company walls. Well, and, and there's no process. I think there is, uh, you know, it's very ad hoc. You, you try to do innovation inside the company, it's kind of ad hoc. Only recently have I seen uh, definitive um, efforts inside co companies to try to create processes that have um, you know, that offer real structure to the innovation process. Of course, there's, you know, the most famous of these is the Google 20% flexible time, which is a total failure, by the way. And, and yeah. Google has also abandoned that <laughs> because that is a complete unstructured structure, and, and that has gone nowhere. But I, I think there is a lot more interesting and a lot more structured uh, innovation processes that are better processes that are being experimented with. Right, exactly. And certainly, uh, corporations are trying to foster innovation within uh, the company, within the existing employees, as well as you've probably seen. There's an increased amount of um, venture investing that are being done by these large corporations, again, specifically because they realize that there is so much innovation going on, and if they don't get involved actively, they will find themselves left by the wayside because the pace of innovation is so quick nowadays. So on that, you know, as an extension of that, um, theme, um, I want to follow up with a question about uh, another myth that Silicon Valley has propagated internationally. Nowadays, you know, whatever Silicon Valley thinks, the whole world starts to think, and, and some of it is very dangerous because what Silicon Valley is thinking, if you sit in South Africa and start thinking the same thing, without any of the infrastructure that Silicon Valley has, you are bound to fail. Right. And then one of these myths is go big or go home. Yeah. I don't think innovation happens this way. 
tell me tell me what you're thinking on this topic. Yeah, you know, and, and unfortunately, I think that what happens is that the uh, the companies that are successful by going big um, are the ones that get highlighted. I think WhatsApp is a good example. I think over the past two years, they lost something like two hundred million dollars. Yeah. Um, and had been the recipients of over sixty million dollars in financing, right. and had had uh, revenues, but not material revenues. And here they are, a twenty billion dollar acquisition. So. Uh, what is the case that's highlighted to everyone? It's WhatsApp, and everyone thinks, yes, well, that's the secret to success, to go big, and then you can become a, a large exit like that. But the fact of the matter is, as, as you and I have uh, have learned and seen over the years, is that literally 99.99% of the, those companies uh, of companies don't um, don't have exits such as that. And uh, you know, I guess maybe the, the analogy would be, yes, there are people who've gotten risk by buying lottery tickets, but that's not uh, an employment strategy that, you know, my job is going to be to go out and buy lottery tickets. So um, you're much better off pursuing the fundamentals of building a real business, one that's valued by customers, has a repeatable sales model, has growing revenue, much better to, off doing that than um, chasing the siren song of uh, going big. Where uh, do you think are the opportunities of building really interesting ventures right now? What's your, you know, investment thesis, so to speak? Boy, yeah, we could talk for a long time about this. Um, so uh, we actually had decided uh, 10 years ago, well before the advent of the term big data, we decided 10 years ago that um, hardware is commoditized and it's free, software is commoditized and it's free, bandwidth is commoditized and it's free. So you can't make money selling any of those. But if all of those things become free, what happens? Well, data gets produced in profusion. So for the past 10 years, our investing philosophy has been and continues to be that it's all about the data. So we continue to focus our um, investing in areas that are, um, that are really based on extracting the semantics of data or providing the semantics for this, this massive data that we're seeing. And particularly in the area of big data and using data for, for business effects, we think we've just entered the, you know, it's like the early industrial age in that, as far as we're concerned. It's like we've just invented the first, you know, steam engine. So the future that lies before us is, is, uh, is pretty vast. Uh, and the companies that get the most interest from us are companies that are focused on that. So one of the things, for example, um, that we've been looking at recently is uh, using, you know, big data for security purposes to do continuous authentication. Um, because you know, continuous authentication would help uh, solve the problems caused by uh, you know, firewalls getting pierced and uh, credentials getting getting compromised. But continuous authentication requires doing continuous big data analytics. So uh, in every area in which we look, I've looked at a couple of deals which are uh, medical informatics, and it's using large-scale data to inform uh, physician decisions on, on not only things like um, uh, prescription, but also even uh, the kinds of tests you should be prescribing for the, the conditions that are being presented. Nowadays, it turns out physicians either um, over-prescribe or under-prescribe um, diagnostic tests and may actually prescribe tests at the facilities which are more expensive than other facilities, unknowingly. And one can employ data to help those physicians um, prescribe the correct test. Same thing for pharmaceuticals. There's something like 15,000 prescribable pharmaceuticals, uh, and physicians being humans like you or I, they have no way of knowing what are the specifics of 15,000 different pharmaceuticals. So they end up doing the same thing that you or I, you and I as patients would be doing, which would be reading the back of the bottle. And when it comes to pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical prescriptions, one size does not fit all, as you can imagine. And you know, certain pharmaceuticals, if overprescribed, can be toxic or if underprescribed. Uh, can lose their efficacy, leading to further you know, downstream effects. So there are teams out there today that are employing big data for pharmacology. So there's kind of no end of options that we see here. So we're very excited about, about, about the developments that are out there. Do you watch uh, Farid Zakaria's Sunday morning GPS show? Uh, you know, I've seen it in passing, uh, but generally no. <laughs> I'm not riding a bike at that time, so yeah, unfortunately not. So it's a very good show, and, and last week actually he did his, uh, the whole show on innovation, and, and one of his guests was Vinod Koshla. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vinod made a comment which I actually agree with, and then kind of segues from your um, <laughs> about medical informatics and uh, 
you know, how doctors prescribe, how doctors even diagnose or, you know, treatment, uh, decide on treatment, if you apply big data to patient scenarios, at any given scenario, the computer, the software, if it's designed properly, is much more capable of coming up with better solutions, better analysis, better pro prognosis, better treatment predictions, prescriptions than a human doctor. So the yeah. thesis is that doctors will be replaced by, let's call it artificial intelligence. And I happen to agree with that. Yeah, I, I happen to agree with that as well. And I think IBM has uh, richly demonstrated this with, with Watson and using Watson as a diagnostician uh, quite effectively. So I completely agree with that. I think perhaps where uh, physicians will still play a key role is that human beings react quite well to the and the moral and emotional support that another individual will give them um, right. just in the manner that they engage with them. So it might be that the physician is delivering the diagnosis and the therapeutic treatment plan, but the diagnosis has been informed to a large part by something like Watson or an AI-based approach. Yeah. Which then, uh, you know, comes to the next, you know, big leap in futuristic discussions is that how far is big data, machine learning, expert systems, AI in general going to go? Where is it taking us? And, and of course, this week, the media is a buzz, and I have also written a piece yesterday about, on this topic um, about Stephen Hawking's comment that if, if we let AI go to its full potential, the species is going to become extinct. And Elon Musk also has sent out a caution on this subject. <laughs> We're probably not talking in the next 20 year or 40 year time frame, but we are probably in the very shockingly actually within striking distance of some extraordinary levels of automation, which renders right. human beings with basically no vocations, no, you know, maybe there's 0.1% of human beings who have something to do and then the rest of the people have nothing to do, no profession, no livelihood. Zombies, what, where are we going? That's, I think it's a great technological and also sociological question, and I don't pretend to be wise enough to know the answers to that. And I, and I find the, uh, the topic wholly engaging, although I'll admit that I haven't read enough about it as yet, so I'm speaking largely from ignorance. So I look forward to reading your piece. I think that would be great. So I'll do that as soon as I get back into the office. Um, yeah, I think there's a real danger there. And, you know, if you think about, um, AI run amok, it's the Terminator movie. You know, Skynet has become self-aware and is now dominating mankind. And certainly something like that could happen where you have a malevolent artificial intelligence. And maybe that's a threat at some point, maybe not. I think probably the, the biggest threat is, um, is artificial intelligence um, inadvertently harming us. So, for example, if you um, – this is just an example off the top of my head, and maybe there's a better example, but – uh, if you had an AI system which was you know, uh, asked to do something as benign as optimize the uh, the, we, uh, the yield from a wheat field, that seems pretty benign, right? So the good mankind, et cetera. But you teach the system, here's what you need to do to make sure that the wheat field is, is as productive as possible. And one morning, the, uh, the AI system detects that there's a family having a picnic on the wheat field. What is it going to do? <laughs> So the the family having a picnic on the wheat field is no different than an invasive crop of locusts as far as the AI is concerned. And so the family is, you know, eliminated. Um, whereas you and I as human beings would not do something like that. Because, okay, yeah, go ahead and have your picnic. But the AI system is doing exactly what it was programmed to do, which is to optimize the yield on the wheat field. So I think that might be the bigger threat, more immediate threat, um, the um, – the unintended consequences of programming them to do something really well. And if we humans insert ourselves into that somehow accidentally, the system doesn't know us. It knows us from a, a locus, frankly, and away we go. Yeah. You know, the other part of this equation, which is what I stressed on in, in my um, article, I didn't go into more, uh, the threat part, which Elon Musk has actually talked about a lot more along the lines of what you're talking about, uh, of the unintended consequences or even AI running amok in a, uh, 
evil way, sort of. Um, I've uh, dealt with more the economic question of if people, you know, their whole, the, the, the pace at which professions are getting automated or will get automated once machine learning really kicks in gear, which as you said, right now we're still at the, at just scratching the surface, right? Machine yeah. learning is really at the absolute beginning of its manifestation into industry. We're probably talking about a 50 year cycle, but machine learning being machine learning has incredible, incredibly fast capacity to become very powerful. So in the next 50 years, I'm positive that we're gonna see machine learning penetrating every aspect of the human endeavor. And if that really starts to take over professions and eliminate or shrink, you know, professional um, professions basically in, in huge numbers, then we are left with a very, very large population on welfare. And that is not economically a sustainable situation. Right, I agree. Right, um, so I, I think we started to see the beginnings of this already. So you've certainly got robotics and manufacturing, and I can foresee that within you know the next ten years, we're going to see self-driving cars, which is perhaps also leading to taxi drivers. Right. So, uh, so we've just begun there, and as we talked about, you know, if you even look at um, professions that require high amounts of training, like uh, being a physician, well, maybe 80% of your job can be done by a Watson-like system. You're only there to Are perform you? the procedure um, and to deliver the diagnosis, that's it. So instead of working eight hours a day, you're working only two hours a day. But perhaps the flip side of that was instead of only seeing you know, 20 patients, maybe you can see 80 patients during the course of the day. So you know, perhaps there's some, some performance improvements there, but yeah, I, I can see that there's going to be a lot of jobs that are eliminated, and I don't see what jobs might be coming to replace those lost jobs. I think the positive opportunity there, as you said, is that maybe a lot more patients will be able to access high-quality medicine because of this, you know, in rural areas and, and where today high-quality medical support is not as available. I think that is a possible positive outcome of this. Um, just scalability because of the machine um, availability, but in the longer term, there there could be elimination and, and may not compute. Right. Um, what about in the medium term? So let's say we are in 2014, about to cross over into 2015. What what are you thinking in terms of the end of the decade? By the end of the decade, what are the major changes we can expect to see? Um, I think we've already started to see them, but uh, you know, in the area of, uh, of data-driven uh, applications, um, we scratch the surface, but we're starting to see actually penetration adoption there. So you know, I've seen uh, a few different teams that have come out of medical schools that are sort of, uh, using you know, large-scale data to actually solve medical problems, which I think has been pretty exciting. Um, there was uh, an article in, I think it was an NPR about a week ago about uh, um, using big data to inform how to write music, better music that's more engaging and more compelling. Um, so uh, then, you know, times about a week ago, there was an article on big data uh, as applied to agriculture. So we're starting to see more and more of this, and, and we're going to see, I think, more of penetration of large-scale data models into things that are done um, either by human intuition alone today or done by only using small amounts of data. And I think the growth of, of unstructured data in particular is, is what's going to drive this. I think heretofore, all of our data-driven applications have been driven off small, relatively small amounts of data sitting in structured databases. And I think that day has passed. I think the future is really going to be based on uh, being data-driven through unstructured data. And what, um, what are you thinking in terms of um, where we go in the, you know, in the, in the next six years on, in terms of this whole bubbly environment that we are dealing with? Um, this, these valuations are ridiculous. They, you talked about WhatsApp. WhatsApp is just representative of a larger phenomenon going on in Silicon Valley where 
fundamentals don't seem to matter anymore. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. I think uh, there's a little bit of a difference. Um, certainly, I, I believe that there is a bubble that's building nowadays, uh, but I think the bubble uh, is building at, at, uh, at a couple of ends. One is at the, uh, at the high end where you have companies like Uber or, or WhatsApp uh, that are benefiting from um, large valuations because people see them as being you know, world-changing in some way. And then there's also a, a bubble at the angel end. There's a very large number of companies that are being angel funded nowadays. Uh, the kinds of companies that we see, the Series A and Series B, Series C companies, um, haven't been as affected. We've seen valuations creep up a little bit, but they haven't been as affected. Um, and I think maybe that's because we tend to focus on you know, boring things like B2B software and infrastructure software, uh, and they don't have the same cachet as uh, as some mobile applications. Um, but you know, I think what we saw uh, 12, 13 years ago when the first dot-com bubble burst was a lot of companies that had gone public that didn't merit having gone public, so companies like Webvan and Tech.com, et cetera, and um, they died probably the deserved death. And so that was a, a um, post-ITO bubble that we've seen, or an ITO and, and post-ITO bubble. Nowadays, it seems that um, mostly the bubble that we see has to do with uh, really early-stage um, seed stage companies, angel funded companies, and there's a very large number of that. As you probably know, the University of New Hampshire tracks this data on an annual basis, and I think last year there were over 70,000 new companies funded by angels, which is a stunningly large number, because if you think about the number of companies that go on to get Series A funding from VCs, that's roughly, and it's been constant for many years, there's roughly about 1,000 companies a year. So you see 70,000 companies or more every year getting angel funding, but only about a thousand moving on to get Series A funding from VC. So, so I think the bubble, as you say, is on that end, and also it's in the um, late stage uh, company end, also where you know if you have actually done, if you have been able to prove your thesis and, and something interesting is happening, then at a pre-IPO stage, the valuations are going completely berserk, right. and and I, I just don't see how that kind of berserk valuations will translate in the public market. They just can't. The public market yeah. is not, not going to tolerate that kind of valuation. Right. No, I, yeah, I don't think so because public market is really uh, driven by things like, you know, price to earnings ratios and things like that. So perhaps the those valuations will come down. Right now. Excuse me? The public market is not as frothy. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So, yeah, I, I believe that's right. I think once uh, companies do go public, the, the valuations will get dampened as they go, you know, go out and get judged uh, relative to other public companies. No doubt some premium will still be paid on the, on the strategic uh, perception of a company. A company like Uber will always command that strategic um, valuation multiple. But uh, in the end, um, the markets are driven by, uh, by profits and earnings. So that's, that's what the final analysis will come down to. So folks listening today, please take one very important statistic away from this session. 70,000 companies got uh, angel financing and, you know, just about 1,000 got Series A venture financing. So you're playing in a very, you know, poor odds game and uh, you have to you have to, if you want to be a serious entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, you have to have persistence and you have to have the stomach to bootstrap to sufficient levels of validation and success such that you're not dependent on venture capital. And of course, you know, VCs actually love to come to the res rescue of victory. So if you can prove that you can be successful, there will be VCs who will want to come to, the, to your rescue at that point, right? And as you said a little bit earlier, Shumar, it's really about building substantive value. You can't just think, I'm going to get big fast and be a huge success. It's not going to happen. It's just like, you know, I can go out and buy lottery tickets, but I'm not going to win, I can guarantee. So as you mentioned at the outset, really focus on building substantive value in your business. And uh, at yeah, the, the University of New Hampshire, they have a Center for Venture Research, and they publish this data quarterly and annually, uh, the number of angel-funded companies every year. Again, in 2013, the number was over 70,000. NBCA uh, has the companion statistic of how many companies get venture financing the Series A, 
And that's generally around a thousand year in, year out. You know, sometimes a little bit more or a little bit less. But if you just marry those two statistics, two statistics together, and you can see kind of the daunting odds you're facing, which brings you back to build value because, as you say, uh, VCs are happy to write to the rescue of victory. So build that substantial value, and those, those VCs will happily leap in and, uh, and <laughs> jump on your coattail. Well, Shomit, thank you for being here, and I know you have another meeting, so uh, we'll continue privately, I'm sure, <laughs> over lunch sometime. Great. And Take care. Portia, thank you so much. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. All right, folks, we are going to continue the session with uh, some of the mentoring program, and we're going to start today with Naga Sridhar. Madhi Raju from Hyderabad, India. Naga, you are up next. So tell us what you're working on. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Ramana, for having me on the first thing. You're welcome. Yeah, you uh, I'll, I would like to discuss about a crowd fund, crowdfunding platform. Yeah. And Go its ahead. limitations uh, in, in current India's, uh, I'm, I'm only targeting on the India's front. Okay. So it, each and every crowdfunding platform in India doesn't have uh, these three issues. I mean, the authenticity on the first note and the reach and the concept on the third note. So nobody uh, will be donating on a regular basis. Say someone donated 100 rupees to, to any, any crowdfunding source uh, today. And tomorrow he might be donating 100 rupees again, but day after, day after and, and a week later, there comes the thinking factor. I mean, uh, nobody wants to continuously donate to those kind of stuff, right? Here, come, here comes uh, the basic solution. I mean, uh, letting the more people in to generate more funds. Say if you have, uh, we have in, integrated a freelancing platform. So people will work and then can donate as well. We can we can generate donations from the freelancing work, job provider, and the job seeker as well. And unlike any crowdfunding platform in India, we have almost 13 plus categories, like starting from animals, business, uh, I mean, creative projects, social causes, poverty, education. We are covering almost 13 plus categories in India. Naga, I, your basic premise that people who are going to be freelancing on your platform will also donate, I don't buy that. Where, where is the validation that that is, the, that is going to be the case? I, I, I somehow it doesn't click with me. Uh, that some, some, uh, a certain percentage of day work generation, the, the, the transaction fee goes into the donation cases as well. It's not so just you... the freelancing people the service provider and the service seeker donating. We are, we are capturing some transaction fees and diverting that to the donation cases. So you are forcing them to donate in your platform? Not really. Uh, say for instance, if the uh, transaction fee is about 100 rupees, the payment gateway costs you about 2%. Yeah. And what we're gonna do is we're going to cost 1% more Apart from the payment gateway fees, and we are diverting that one percent to the donations. So who's donating? You are donating. Who's deciding on what projects get that donation? Uh, it can be from the both service provider and the service seeker, or the regular donor as well, to to decide onto the what category to donate or what cost to donate. It can be specific donation, or it can be general donation as well. So then you have a, 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 the other issue is how do you build the freelancing? You're now going up against companies like Elance and Odesk and so forth in terms of building a freelancing platform, which is a very crowded, very highly established market. Um, how are you going to do exactly. that? That's the first order of business. Uh, unlike, unlike more of uh, freelancing platforms like Odesk, Elance, freelancing.com, they are, they are majorly famous in uh, metro cities are already developed cities. What we're going to do is we are also concentrating on the tier two and tier three cities mm -hmm. to get this freelancing platform into the multiple um, multiple segments. Self-penetrated everywhere. I'm sorry, I lost you. Come again? 
The freelancing platforms are plenty well penetrated in all of those cities. We hire from Jaipur, we hire from, I mean, they're everywhere right now. No, uh, yes, they, they are everywhere, but uh, a school teacher, imagine a school teacher in the uh, in the very remote area, remote village. So he, he or she doesn't know about freelancing word at all. And there are yeah, freelance journalists and... Uh, if they don't know, then you will have to teach them somehow, and that customer acquisition is a very, very complicated, cumbersome, expensive process. Exactly. That's not a that's not necessarily an easy market for you to penetrate either. I mean, uh, we we're going to conduct uh, like we're going to target most of the unemployed people are people who who need funds in India and then who can donate in India. And uh, a simple uh, unemployed HR can work on the freelancing front, then earn 10 rupees or 20 rupees per resume built. And then we are also generating funds so for the donation cases. Out. Your concept is not fleshed out at all. All these assumptions that you're making, how are you going to get to these people? What is the positioning? How are you going to acquire customers? These things need to be thought through. Yes, definitely. In the next, uh, can you please uh, scroll on to the next slide? Sure. The it's it's more on first thing we we targeting on the donations front. So we we meeting companies with the CSR activities, and then uh, we go on the on the marketing front and the customer acquisition front. We are going to do that with digital marketing and the manual marketing as well connecting some more events across India. Not convinced. You I mean, to, uh, well, you, you're getting a lot of things mixed up. CSR does not, if you're talking about corporate CSR, then they're going to be looking for projects. They're going to be looking for NGOs to support and nonprofits to support and so forth who will be doing work in these remote places. That has nothing to do with freelance. That is not, that's just a project, a connecting project with CSR. That could be a reasonable business. If you focus just on that, that could be a reasonable business of connecting projects in remote areas to CSR activities. However, typically, most NGOs have presence in big cities and work with CSR um, you know, sponsors even if they're working in remote areas. So, so you don't need to necessarily market to them on those remote areas. You can market to them through their headquarters. But, but I can see that being a reasonable value proposition where you're connecting projects and NGOs and, and nonprofits with CSR divisions of various companies. That's, re that's a reasonable value proposition. Okay. Uh, so, so uh Using this freelancing and the crowdfunding model integration doesn't work or doesn't have any pro value proposition at all. I don't see it. Okay. I, uh, uh, complicated to I, mean, uh, I would like to know. Yeah, you, you, you're saying it will be fumble or uh, it will be it will be customer acquisition will be a bigger problem, right? Customer acquisition is going to be too cumbersome. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, so keeping that freelancing front aside, uh, crowdfunding platform, NGOs, and then uh, the CSR activities and the regular donors as well. So that, uh, the there, current platforms... On that theme that you're connecting CSR with projects, if you, let's say you start with that and you, you build a platform to bring a lot of nonprofits and NGOs on a platform and, and a lot of CSR uh, groups at different companies, donating on that platform, then you have the beginning of maybe starting some sort of a, a non-profit freelancing around that where people who want to do volunteer work, people who work, have other jobs and, and want to do volunteer work, want to do charity work, contribute in philanthropic ways, you can bring more people like that into that platform who can then work with these NGOs and so forth. So that, that could be the angle. That, that logic, that story flows, that logic flows, and you can actually organically grow something in that mode. But, um, but the way you presented your story, I don't think that will work. Okay. 
So on, on to that NGOs front, uh, the major crowdfunding, at least on, on uh, online platforms, not unlike these NGOs and then CSR, CSR activities, we have these major four uh, competitions, Start 51, yeah. Mila, Bitgiving, and Wishberry. And uh, they, are, they are only into selected platforms, I mean selected categories only. You will also have to be on selected categories. Uh, 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 say for instance, uh, Start 51 only, only enables the creative projects. So how many people or what kind of people uh, will be interested to donate, uh, say for instance, uh, a dollar for the creative projects? Which is, I think, perfectly okay. The fact that they're focusing on a specific category is perfectly okay. You could also donate, uh, you work on a specific category. And, you know, people will grow in, in time, but starting market penetration, from a market penetration strategy point of view, we actually recommend that you start somewhere, you know, more specific, more, you know, managed, as opposed to going the terminology we use is going spray and pray. We don't want you to go spray and pray. Yeah, so, so the reason behind we concentrating on multiple categories is to address more issues and to get in more customers. Uh, you can't do that right off the bat, right away. It, you have to do it with a little, you know, in time. You have to start somewhere, and that's right now what you present here, all these other companies who are focusing on specific categories because they're very early, and you're even earlier. So you have to start somewhere with a small limited scope so that you can start to validate things. And all these companies are very early, okay. very young companies, and they have to be very specific and very focused. Okay. Yeah, okay. as I mentioned, the, the customer acquisition will the be one both thing on that manual I would like, and Discord. Have just a second? One, th one thing I would like you to adjust your thinking on is how are you going to put one foot before the other? This is something we stress a lot in the 1M1M one &one program. This whole business, like we discussed with Shomit earlier, this whole business of go big and go home is not our philosophy. You have to start somewhere. Okay. Start small, start validating. You can have a large vision, end game vision. You know, one million by one million is a very big vision, right? That doesn't mean yes. that we are not putting one foot before the other on a daily basis and tackling small steps to make our mission successful and be successful, be survive as a business. You have to survive as a business. And you can't do that by going big or going home. You know, if you go out of business, if you go home, then you will never get to build a business, really. That's not how businesses are built. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Okay, well, yes. um, so I yeah, think if that's you... that's from my side. Um, and... if, you, if you take what I told you and, and start kind of putting together a plan for putting... You can use crowdfunding, by the way, but in, that, in the crowdfunding platform, the two sides of the platform perhaps are these NGOs and nonprofits working on maybe development projects, humanitarian projects, whatever. You choose where you are comfortable, where your passion lies. And on the other side, you bring together corporate CSR groups that are interested in funding those projects. That is a reasonable, manageable business that you can start executing on. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Shamana. You're welcome. John, you're up next. Uh, thank you, uh, Shamana, for uh, having me. Um, I am assuming everyone can hear me okay. Yes. Uh, forgive me if uh, this is maybe not the right forum for what I'm proposing here. I, this is, I'm new to this, and um, I basically was invited to do this, and it sounded like a great idea. So I'm going to go ahead and present what I what my idea is, and see uh, see how it goes. Um, basically, I am uh, I live in Chicago, Illinois, and um, I'm uh, uh, I've been I've been in the workforce for a long time, uh, running my own businesses, doing uh, basically IT and finance work for the last thirty some years, uh, family businesses. And uh, on the side, I kind of tinker with ideas that I have, and, and uh, I came across an idea that I really enjoy. One of my um, hobbies is I play drums in a rock band. 
So I, I play in very aggressive, loud music that uh, most people don't particularly like, but uh, nevertheless, it's something that I enjoy, and drumming has become a passion of mine. So um, basically, I came up with an idea of a way to improve or create a new type of uh, drum pedal, which is what the uh, drummer hits with their foot to make a, a noise on a, on a big bass drum that you typically see. Um, and if I can go to the next slide, is it something I can control, or do I have to have you do that? There, there you go. This is a, a typical, very elaborate drum set, but those two big drums at the bottom are, the, are called the bass drums, and there's a pedal at the back of them that the drummer who's sitting behind this, the, the kit uh, hits with his foot. Um, the current uh, tr traditional drum style right now is that a drummer will use a, a pedal that when they push down on the on the pedal, it hits it hits the bass drum and makes one sound, one one impact, one sound. And the faster they, harder they do it, the louder and faster the the drum beat is. Um, however, it's limited to uh, pretty much one sound per depression of the pedal. So, in a nutshell, my idea is to create a drum pedal that will allow multiple hits, multiple impacts of a of a drum of the beater on the drum head with each depression of the foot pedal so that you could so, so that a drummer could get an, an, an effective sound and I'm going to try and make the sound so that everyone can kind of understand and um, that would sound kind of like and I, I hope that didn't sound too corny but um, essentially uh, that would allow a drummer to push down on the pedal one time and have it beat the, the drum head multiple times and the idea behind all this is that it would open up a whole um, a whole new style of sound, particularly for drum solos, but also for in, in general music that drummers could make and, and add to their uh, their 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 skill ability. And um, this this design that I have is uh, is is rather simple and would and, and actually go, let's go to the next the next uh, uh, slide and I'll I'll kind of give you an idea what it looks like. Um, in the upper left-hand corner there, that's a tr that's a side view of a traditional drum pedal, and it's, as you can imagine, someone pushes down on that pedal and it pulls the little chain and, and pulls that beater forward, which then impacts the drum head, which you see down in the in the bottom. That, that's the front picture of the drum head, uh, and then makes one sound. So my idea is to uh, add a device to the bottom to the to the where it says um, I don't know I, I can't really point on this, can I? No. No. Okay. So, um, in the upper left-hand corner, where where it says uh, uh, potentiometric sensor, to put a sensor underneath the pedal, that would then um, send a signal when it was depressed, when the when the uh, when the pedal is depressed, would send a signal to that uh, d uh, controller in the upper right-hand corner, which would then send another signal to a uh, an, an actuator of some kind that would would basically beat the drum head uh, multiple times. And if you want to go to the next slide, um, I don't know. I'll, should, I, should I read this, or will I let everyone else read it themselves? No, you or, need to. You, you don't need. You don't read slides. You just synthesize and, and say what you're talking about. So we don't need to get into the details of how this device works. I, okay. I, I don't think that's necessary. Um, so, so essentially, what you have is a concept for a product that you believe musicians would be interested in. Buying is that what you're saying? That is that is exactly correct. And and what I'm really trying to do is to uh, find a company um, that will help to actually create a couple of prototypes of this, the fun functional prototypes. In, I, in in the area where I live in Chicago, there are many 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 music stores um, and many distributors of musical products. And I've I've talked to several of them uh, about this general idea without even without pictures, and they've all been just fascinated and thought, oh, that's just a fantastic idea. Um, but of course, not having something to hand them or show them, you know, the impact's not there. So what I was hoping to do is to find a company who could produce a prototype for me. Um, I have done a patent search on it, and this particular idea uh, has not been patented yet. So I'm, I I could go ahead. Have and Have you done it, a search but, on who manufactures products like this? Who may have the skill set to manufacture? products like this? Have you done that research? 
Uh, that, that's basically where I'm at right now. But, but before I do the manufacturing part, I want to just get a working prototype, and, I, and then I want to take that prototype to uh, several of the bigger um, uh, distributors or outlets for musical instruments here and, and show them that and say, you know, if I make this, would you buy these, and how many would you buy, and, and do a little bit of marketing ahead of time so I can find well, out what way, kind of Either way, whatever, it is. whether it's a prototype or the actual production, you have to, you need somebody who has a skill set to build something like this, and you need to find a... Um, a manufacturing partner, and, uh, and, and that's something that you need to research and, and locate who that is who, and, and do a cost analysis and all of these stuff, the stuff that people do when you're trying to manufacture a product. You can look on Alibaba for all the Chinese suppliers who, you know, all the Chinese manufacturers are on Alibaba, and they do a huge amount of international business. Mm -hmm. Yes, and as a matter of fact, I have contacted uh, two companies, um, one in China and actually one in India, and uh, they both have uh, – uh, I've sent them basically the same slideshow we have here, and uh, they they thought that they could could prepare this, but um, the, the cost has been somewhat prohibitive for me. So, um, you know, I, I, ideally, I'd like to find someone uh, who is, would like to share that cost. How much are they coding? Um, somewhere around $15,000 to, to produce a, pro a prototype. So go raise fifteen thousand dollars on uh, with a crowdfunding campaign. These kinds of projects do very well in crowdfunding. Okay, well then that would be something I would probably need to research and learn about. I've, I've heard of the term crowdfunding, but I've never I have no experience with it whatsoever. And maybe I can get some ideas. Perfect somebody. kind of project to go um, go fund on a crowdfunding basis, and and you go sell. Uh, you know, you you're going to need to learn how to do that. You're going to need to market to musicians and and so on and so forth. But this is the perfect solution for something like that. Okay, any suggestions? Should I just Google crowdfunding and then educate myself about crowdfunding that way, or is there any specific lines? Tons of information on crowdfunding online. So yeah, go do your research. Okay, all right, that's fair enough. Uh, so that, that's great. I think that's all I have for the moment then. I want to say thank you for your time. I think that's, those are the two pieces of research you need to find. If you've already identified manufacturers that can do it and you're happy with their capabilities, um, and, and, you know, I imagine that this product is not going to be a $15,000 product, in which case I don't – I think it's going to be too expensive. So when you get into actual manufacturing, I imagine the price is going to come down significantly, yeah? Yes, that's correct, yeah. And this end up sale – you know, the, the commercial price for the seller will be a couple hundred dollars. So the manufacturing price per unit has to be, you know, $100 or so. So how why does it cost $15,000 to to prototype? Well, uh, you know, like I said, this is new for me, and I've only contacted two um, uh, inventor production design people, and they've both quoted some That is some not trust. reasonable at all. Sorry? That number is not if, – if your end product is going to be a $100 product, there's absolutely no way you should be spending $15,000 prototyping it. Uh, well, it seemed like a lot to me, but uh, I, both of them have quoted two different companies have quoted the same, roughly the same pricing, and so I'm assuming that's got to be just in the in the the R and D part of it. Uh, which tells me, actually, if that is the case, then you will not be able to get the price down to hundred dollars per piece, and and then the whole whole thing is a is a wastage of time. Uh, that that could be. Um, I guess I would have to just maybe call a few more companies and find out if they uh, if there's anybody that's more reasonable than that. I mean, it could be ten times the cost. It could be even you know maybe a thousand, two thousand dollars if your end price goal is price target is a thousand dollars. But otherwise, it's too crazy. The other place you could go is uh, Quirky. You know, Q U I R K Y is a okay. is an innovation crowdsourced innovation company, go to their website and study how that works. That is another place where innovative products often, and they have manufacturing capabilities and everything. So that there you could get some sort of a royalty sharing arrangement and, and so forth, and they have manufacturing capabilities themselves. Q-U-I-R-K-Y? Mm -hmm. Yeah, quirky. All right. That sounds great. Okay, well, I appreciate that advice. Thank you. Try these different leads that I gave you and see what happens. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good luck, John. Okay. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, folks. Uh, looks like we are um, done with the presentations and the mentoring with the people who have sl uh, sent in slides ahead of time. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to you about 1M1M and how to use the program.
open up the line for Q&A and anybody can call in and, and I'll be happy to work with anybody else on any of your issues. So now if you like what we do here, please refer serious entrepreneurs into 1M1M. We need serious entrepreneurs who are willing to put in the work to build value and that takes many years, you know, to build sustainable companies that are going to be serious revenue, serious profits, and deliver serious customer value. This is not a fly-by-night, go big or go home kind of philosophy. We are interested in people who are building real businesses. Um, everything we offer resource-wise is at 1mby1m.com. Um, we have one completely free resource, that's our blog, and many of you actually follow the blog already, so it's a very, as you know, it's a very, very rich content place where you learn a lot from lots of people who have done it before. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series has the same philosophy, which is we have, in each volume, we have case studies of successful entrepreneurs and we provide essays, analysis, and synthesis of methodology, of certain topics, of specific issues that uh, would help you navigate this very, very cumbersome, complicated, turbulent world of entrepreneurship. So we've published, at this point, we've published 11 books um, in the Entrepreneur Journey series. All of them are available as Kindle books all over the world. And that's, the, that's our preferred or recommended method for you to buy the books. Um, these, this is what the site looks like. There are videos in there, and uh, uh, you will find a lot of the questions you may have about the 1M1M program, you will have them answered in these featured videos, in these FAQ videos, so to speak. Purchases. These sessions, these, uh, can you please go on mute, program. John? I think you're I'll streaming noise into the call. Or Maureen, can you put John on mute? Thanks. Um, we have these roundtables, these mentoring sessions happen almost every Thursday, unless there's a holiday. So almost 50 times a year we are here. Um, we've had, you know, 240 of these already, so it's been going on for a long time, and you're very welcome to come to these and use them. Uh, if you go to the website, we have all the calendar and, and registration links and everything there. Um, we have a premium program that's a $1,000 annual membership fee. We offer you extensive methodology guidance. We have a great curriculum. We help you with business development, introductions to potential customers, channel partners, investors, media analysts, potential advisors, mentors, whatever will help you move forward. And we give you extensive strategy consulting as well. We, we can call it strategy consulting, mentoring, coaching, whatever, but we give you a tremendous amount of help. The Million Dollar Club is a set of case studies we've published that are successes in the program, people who have crossed the million dollar threshold. Uh, we provide you with an ROI equation, the 1M1M one one value equation, and that is uh, we offer $375,000 plus 5 to 10% equity worth of value for just $1,000 annual membership fee. And we do not have any concept of graduation. You can use the program for as long as you want to. We have many of our members using the program for many years. And we do not charge you any equity. So it's a very entrepreneur-friendly entrepreneur program. And we give you lots of orientation material on how to use the program. The self-assessment is available free on the website. I suggest that you take a look at it and ask these questions of your venture. And that will give you a good calibration of where you are, where things, you know, how things look and so forth. 1mby1m.com is the site, again, and uh, there's tons of information about the premium program, what to expect from it, video FAQs and so forth, which will help you learn about the program. The curriculum is delivered in video lectures and case studies. We have been inviting experienced, successful entrepreneurs to tell the stories of how they have been successful and shared their entrepreneurial journeys as case studies and shared their strategies, what has worked, what hasn't, and their advice to entrepreneurs. And we have captured all of that in a very powerful volume of over 600 case studies, and we've synthesized a lot of it as video lectures. 
So now we, you have a very efficient, very powerful methodology of learning how to be an entrepreneur, how to put one foot before the other, a very comprehensive, at the same time, very efficient way to learn. And it's working. You know, we have, at this point, we are just about at the four-year point that this curriculum has been in existence and it's been enriched every month since it has been launched. And we have a large number of entrepreneurs who have used and are using this curriculum to learn entrepreneurship. It works marvelously. We have a set of core modules, bootstrapping, positioning, market sizing, customer validation, financing, customer acquisition, and team building. And then there are electives, Web 3.0 and e-commerce, cloud computing and business solutions, outsourcing and consulting, uh, mobile and social apps, online education, gaming, healthcare IT, and a variety of others, building unicorn companies is a new module that we introduced this fall, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, you, we, are, we recommend that you budget about 50 hours of core curriculum time and then, you know, probably another 50 hours working on an interactive mode with electives as well as coming to roundtables and so forth as your, you know, program time. And uh, we are fairly confident that if you put in the time and the work, we are very confident that we will be able to help you move forward with your uh, work with your business. Our methodology is lean capital efficient bootstrap startups. We don't assume that you're going to raise $60 million in venture capital out of the gate. Um, and some of our companies have raised a lot of money. Um, one of our companies has raised $44 million in venture capital, but that's not where we started. This company came to us with nothing. It was a, you know, just a little prototype. And then we went from there to the first they, we helped them win a $40,000 grant, then a million-dollar venture capital round, and then build organically on top of that. So you don't go from zero to huge gobs of venture capital in one day. There's a lot of time, a lot of process, a lot of hard work, and a lot of years that um, have to be invested in building a really successful, serious company. Um, we do work with the media quite a lot, and we have clout in the media. So whereas most small companies have very difficult, have a very difficult time getting any coverage in the media, we actually are able to get coverage for our companies because of that clout, and we are very generous with that and very diligent with that. We do believe that you need coverage so that people get to know about you and you're not the best kept secret in the world. Uh, you're potential customers need to hear about you, and we help you navigate that process. We also have an extensive social media presence, so we give you access to all our social media channels and help you propagate your messages through those, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, blog, everything we have substantial presence in, and you are uh, invited as part of your membership to propagate your messages through those channels. Uh, we do have an affiliate program, so people who are building entrepreneurship development organizations or programs around the world are welcome to partner with us. We have two more roundtables this year, uh, next week and the week after, and in both events we have a guest each. And then uh, the last book I want to mention is Vision India 2020, which is my uh, you know, ideation book, so to speak. Uh, I wrote it a few years ago now, and there, it has $45 billion business ideas, and it's written as business fiction, as if we are sitting in 2020 looking back on building these ideas. This is focused on emerging markets. It talks about India. It uses Indian analogies, but if you read the book, it will apply to a lot of the developing countries, emerging markets as well. Incubator in a Box is our platform that we use with various corporate partners, other you know, governments, uh, investors, and so forth to uh, do entrepreneurship development work. They use us to run incubation programs or augment incubation programs. As I talked about earlier, Bootstrapping with a Paycheck is the book we've launched this month, and it's a very powerful book that 
completely invalidates this notion that you have to quit your job to get your company off the ground. You don't. You can get your company off the ground while holding on to your full-time job and doing it on the side, building organically, building slowly, validating, tinkering, whatever it takes to get to a point where you can then maybe jump in with both feet. So contrarian perspective, validated perspective, take a look, very interesting. Other books we published this fall are Carnival in the Cloud, published in October, which talks about cloud entrepreneurs and how they have navigated and been successful. And in September, we published From E-Commerce to Web 3.0, focusing on the e-commerce uh, market and its tremendous growth right now. We have 15 entrepreneurs profile here, very successful, very interesting perspectives, and you will learn a lot from their journeys and how they have navigated their path forward. So that's it. We have time for Q&A. If you would like to, um, if you would like to dial in and ask questions, please do. Uh, do not send me private messages. This is a public chat, but you can ask questions in public chat as much as you want. Gautam Rastogi is asking for the roundtable on the 18th. Are you accepting pitches? Yes. You can go to the um, go to the web page and register to pitch, and Maureen will be back in touch with you with instructions. So questions, comments, either by phone, by dial-in, or in the public chat, please feel free to move forward with your questions. And while you're thinking about that, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson who, on the One Million by One Million team, who is happy to talk to any of you about the program. If you're considering joining the one one m program and would like to talk to someone on our team, please call Irina. Her phone number is 786-301-2456. Irina at 1mby1m.com. Her Skype ID is Irina underscore Patterson. That's it. From our side, that's it. So either you have questions or we're going to wrap up and get on with our work. Anybody? No questions. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show, and uh, we will see you back here next week. Thank you for coming. Bye, everybody.